Shalom and blessings to all you out there and here today. We praise Him for who He is. Hallelujah. And happy Father's Day. A blessed day to you fathers out there. And we wish you the best. The Heavenly Father is so good to us. He is so great. Yes. He pours His love out on us. His mercy endures to the last breath that we take here. Hallelujah. I want to be able to take the last breath here and have the breath in His place when it's all said and done. Not the other place. There's only two places. And I want His heavenly place that He has for us. And let's just work for that and live for that in this these last days. Amen, amen. He's still in charge. He's still got it all in control. Nobody else does. Ever, some think they have it in control, but no. Our Heavenly Father has it in control. Happy Father's Day to you, Heavenly Father. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Minister Peggy Hickey is coming today with the precious Holy Word. So receive today. Let it be. We just send it out to you with this shout. And just receive today what He has for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Homer. I am so blessed to be here tonight, especially on this wonderful day, Father's Day. Amen. And I want, I, I want to just say a blessing to all fathers, wherever you are. We thank you for your work, your service, your love, your passion. May you be blessed in everything you do. And, and, and may finances and, and um, love and strength from the Holy Spirit just fill your life. Today, uh, on Father's Day, I want to talk about our Heavenly Father and what a very good Father that we do have. He is absolutely good and absolutely love and absolutely perfect. Amen. He loves us without measure. How many of you know that our Heavenly Father wants the best for us all? Amen. All the time. He is the supreme example of what fatherhood looks like. Amen. There are many young men today that come from broken homes. And they do not, and some of them don't even know their fathers. They've never met him. He left before they were, while they were still very small. Or he just disappeared one day, or he's in prison, or they just got divorced. And we don't know the reasons. Nobody's judging here. But these young men, they don't know what it's like to have a father, so they don't know like what it's like to be a father. And as they go into that adulthood and they become fathers, they can look for their example of what a father should be in this Bible. Amen. God has given us all the instructions we need in that to be the perfect father and the perfect mother, but today's Father's Day. And we are told this by um, Yeshua because he said that he came to show us what the Father was like. That was one of his main purposes of coming. It wasn't the only one. He had many others. And, uh, but this was what one thing he said. I have come to show you the Father. And so if you don't see something happening in Yeshua, it is not going to be something the father does the supreme attribute attribute of our heavenly father is love Amen. and first john 4 8 the word says the one who does not love does not know god before god is love Amen. when the bible speaks of the love of god it is not talking about a feeling godly love is displayed in action and it is moral and it has purpose it is do the godly love is doing the best for the other person even if it costs you and john 3 16 and 17 the word tells us that for god so loved the world he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that was costly his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent him so that the world through his son might be saved. The son is Yeshua, our savior. The cost of eternal destiny was the life of God's son and the cost of reconciliation with God. Romans 5.8 tells us that God so demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. It is important here to note that we did not deserve God's love. We didn't do anything to earn God's love. We were sinners. We were, doing, we were in rebellion against God. We were living far from God. But God still sent his son to die for us. Amen. How many times have we thanked God for our life? For his son, for the gifts that he gives us, for his goodness. And right now, I just want to say, Father, we thank you. We thank you for every single thing you do for, every, for, do for us every day. But we especially thank you for your son, Yeshua, and for the salvation we have through him. In Romans 5.5, 5, we learn that God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he gave us. Now, the word poured out here is from the word, Greek word ekchuno, and it means to bestow. But the word has the connotation of headlong and gushing. Therefore, God did not give us a little of his Holy Spirit, but he gave us a gushing amount of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Therefore, um, uh, and, and the word says that out of us will flow rivers of living water, but that living water is coming from the Holy Spirit that God yes. gave us. God did not give us a little. He gave us more than enough. God gave his son. God gave his spirit. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 3, we learn that God has loved us with an everlasting love and that with loving kindness, he draws us. Yeshua tells us in John 6, that no one can come to him unless the father draws him. So some people were going, well, I don't come to the Lord. I don't know the Lord. Why? What do you mean? He never drew me. Yes, he has. He has sent someone in your life to tell you about Jesus. Amen. You have heard a message and you have felt a tug at your heart. God draws everybody, but not everybody answers. And first, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, we are told that God does not wish any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Our Heavenly Father loves everyone and does not want anyone to be lost. James 1.17 declares, Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow. Now I want us to think about this for a moment. Every good gift comes down from the Father of light. Every good thing and every good gift. Some people believe that God doesn't care, that he's not actively working in our lives, that he's just kind of like some mysterious figure up there that created us and then abandoned us. But that is not true. No. He is intimately involved in every part of our life every single day. And the more we go to him, the more involved he is. Maybe you haven't got... It, you don't know God because you don't talk to him or listen to him or do what he wants. Everything you ask for is from, it, that is good, you have gotten from God. It doesn't matter who you got it through, but you got it from God. He put it in the hearts of someone to do it for you or to give it to you or to bless you with something. And God loves to surprise us. He loves to surprise us and he loves to answer the requests of his children. Now, I'm just going to share a couple of things that show just how immature I am as a Christian, especially when I first started becoming a Christian. When I first became a Christian, and I was 10 years old, and I was a little bit of a procrastinator. I did not necessarily study for my spelling tests ahead of time. So the Thursday night, because the spelling test was always on Friday, I would pray, oh God, oh God, please let that spelling test be canceled. Do you know that he canceled spelling tests for me three times? Now, at some point, he does require that I actually study. And so I couldn't keep presuming that he was going to do that. But he answered that request of a child. 
And maybe you don't think that's a big deal, but it was a big deal to me, and it showed me that he cared. When I was in Korea, and I was in my um, 30s or 40s at the time, and uh, I was there as teaching at Hanam University as a self-supporting missionary. And sometimes you'd have to take taxis a lot of places unless you want to crowd onto their buses, which is not always convenient because it's hard to get off. And so uh, I, I got a little tired because the taxi drivers in Korea, I love them to death, but they are a little pushy. And they're always wanting to know, why don't you know the language and how long you've been here and why aren't you married and so on and so on. And so one day I was leaving the library at Hanam and I said, oh God, please, could you send me an English speaking taxi driver? You know, so I didn't have to deal with trying to explain things to them. It was pouring down rain. And I rushed out of the library with my umbrella and ducking and, and I uh, grabbed the first taxi I came to and I jumped inside and my feet landed in a puddle of water ankle deep in the floor of the taxi. And I went, oh, and the taxi driver started laughing. And then he started talking to me in English. And then as we were driving, not only was he talking to me in English, but he had been in Texas and he was a Baptist pastor who was moonlighting as a taxi driver to help pay his expenses. Now, God did not just what I asked, but more than I asked. And that, he couldn't have given me a million dollars and impressed me more. So, I mean, so I, w I was just, I was surprised, but there is no reason why I should have been, because the word tells us that God gives us exceedingly abundantly uh, Abe, and he was, he's exceedingly abundantly able to do more than we could ask or even imagine or even think. And so God answered that prayer. Every time, oh, and so I just want to say he will answer yours too. Before I go into this next point, I just want to say he will answer yours. Trust him. Try him. Write him down. Remember them. He will amaze you. Every type of true love in the world is from the Father. Now, I put an emphasis on true there. I am not talking about perversions and lust that some call love. Uh, these, that is carnal or fleshly, and it is usually selfish. And I am not talking about, oh, I love that the Dodgers. No, I don't love the Dodgers, especially now. Uh, I mean, I love that baseball team, or I love, uh, I love this dessert. No, we use that term so loosely in our language. We don't distinguish between what is true love and what is not. But the pure divine love from God is infinite. Think it. He is infinite and his love is infinite. There is no end to it. He is, he is pure, capital L-O-V-E. His love is self-sacrificing. And he showed us this by sending his son to die for us. His love redeems. His love comforts. His love forgives. His love heals. It protects. It provides. The list you can, is infinite. Just someday sit down and try to think of all the things that God has done for you in your life. We see shadows of God's love every day around us. It is displayed uh, in the love of a good parent for their child. I know when I was growing up, my father sacrificed often for his children. And there was one year that he needed a new coat. But instead of getting a new coat, he bought us shoes. Now, you might not think living in Texas that that's a big deal, but at that time, we were living in Minnesota, and not having a warm winter coat was a very big deal. And so uh, I, I learned a lot about self-sacrificing love from my father, but he was just a shadow of the Heavenly Father's love. There are other examples that reflect God's love and character we see around us, and that is a little child's love for his parents. How can a little child, how a little child, you know, these little toddlers, before that they learn that the world is bad, they will just charge to the door when they hear daddy coming. Daddy, daddy. And they're so excited that daddy's home. And they'll raise up their hands and they go up, up, because they want to be picked up. You know, and our father wants us to come to him like that. Jesus said that we have to come to him like a child. With that same love, that same innocence, that same surety that he will respond and he will respond in a loving manner and he will never reject us. 
A lot of times when I, I have a day that's just overwhelming or I have a problem I don't understand, I will go to, I will go to my daddy God, <laughs> my heavenly father, and I will say to him, Lord, I just feel like a little infant. Could you just like hold me in your arms and just, you know, quiet my soul and help me to understand what I need to do? And he does. He does it every time. And so uh, in the, in the Bible, so if you, and, and in Matthew 4, 7, 11, <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, uh, he tells us that if you, despite being evil or sinners, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father who is in heaven give good, give good gifts to those who ask him? So our heavenly father loves us beyond measure, desires an intimate relationship with us, and gives us good gifts. Um, a final example of the kind of love that we can see reflected around us of God's is between a husband and a wife. And, uh, and if, you, if you have a good marriage, as the years go by, that becomes, there becomes a oneness to where people just get so close that you can't even tell the difference. They'll, they'll, re, they'll say something and the other person will finish their sentence. Or the love that you have for a friend who has gone through hard times with you and supported you. All of these are just shadows, dim reflections of the love that God has for us. Many people are far from God. And they don't know him. And, and they believe a lie. They believe that he doesn't care. They believe that he's cruel. They believe that he's mean. That... The, he's judging them constantly. But this is a lie that has been given to them by Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Amen. Some of them even believe that God does not exist. But God does, and he cares, and he will forgive anyone who comes to him. Some people have... Uh, are far from God because they have gone out into the world and they've got involved in things that they shouldn't have. And they have done some of them really bad things and they don't love themselves and they hate what they've done. And so they think, well, how can God ever forgive me? I am, I'm not going to list anything because the Holy Spirit will tell you what it is that's keeping you from having a close relationship with the Lord. But the Father says that if you, he is faithful to forgive us if we come to him and confess our sins. Amen, right. He is faithful and just. Uh, the passage for that is 1 John 1, 9, but it's just something that you can know and you can hold on to. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some people don't want to come. I know this was my father's testimony. He said he didn't want to come to God until he got his life right. Well, you can't get your, right, your life right until you come to God because you cannot cleanse yourself. Only the Holy Spirit can, only God can cleanse you. Only the Holy Spirit can cleanse you. And that can't even be done until you have Yeshua as your Savior. Amen. So once you get him as your Savior, you become a new creation. And then God can begin a good work in you that he's going to continue until Jesus comes back. Yes. It's not going to happen in one day. It's not going to happen immediately. He starts it when you, you, when you take that first step. Father, forgive me. I am sorry I did this. Let me be your child. And then God begins that good work in you. Jesus comes into your life. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit starts working in you. And then as you spend time with the Lord, you get closer and closer to him. There is a great parable in the book of Luke in the Gospels that talks about exactly this thing. And it's found in Luke 15, 11 through 24. It's actually 11 through 32, but 11 through 24 deals with the prodigal son, and the rest of it deals with the elderly son. So there is a man who has two children, two boys, and he is a man with property, an estate, he has servants, and one day his youngest son comes to him, and he does the unthinkable he says to his father, I would like my inheritance now. 
Now, in the Jewish culture and in my culture, too, to ask your father for an inheritance while he's still alive is like saying you wish he was dead already. And it's very offensive. But the father just took out everything that he had and he split it between his two sons. And he gave the elder son his portion. He gave the younger son his portion. And then the younger son took all of his inheritance and he went to a far country. Now, why did he go to a far country? Because he did not want to be anywhere where his father could hear about what he was doing or check on him or if what he was doing would reflect back on his father. And the, and the word of God tells us that he spent all of the stuff, that, all of his inheritance in riotous living. That means wasteful. He, he just, he, he acted like there was no end to the money that he had. And he, uh, he we don't even know all the things that it, it, uh, he did wrong, but one of the connotations for the word riotous and wasteful is debauchery. So there could have been sexual perversion, drugs, alcohol. We don't know, but it was pretty bad. And he wasted it all. Well, after the money was gone, the great famine comes to this land. And guess what? All the friends he had when he had money disappeared. Yes. And this, this, this boy, this young man, all he could do was to find a job taking care of feeding pigs. Now, in the Jewish culture, that is the very lowest job you can have because they are forbidden to raise pigs. And so here he is working in a pig pen every day, starving to death and wishing that he could take in some of the dirty husks that the pigs were eating because he was so hungry. And the word of God says that he came to himself. One day he just came to himself and he thought, wait, in my father's house, even the servants are well fed and taken care of. Why am I still here like this? I will go to my father and I will tell him, Father, I no longer deserve to be called your son, but let me live here as your servant. And so he just practicing this over and over again as he walks back to where his father lives. And as he comes, his father is looking out for him. He's watching for him. And as he sees him while he's afar off, the father runs to the son. The son didn't even make it to the father. The father runs to the son and he hugs him. And he said, you can just imagine him saying, my son, my son, my son who was lost is found. Because he does say that to the elder son later. And he says, and, when, and the son gets out his, his words. My father, I, I no longer deserve to be uh, your son. And I want to be your servant. And the father ignores him. And he calls for his, serv his servants. And he says, bring a robe for my son bring a ring for my son bring sandals for my son all of these have very significant meanings the robe is like being covered with the righteousness of Jesus the ring is a signif signifies that he is a son that he has the authority of a son and he can actually do things in his father's name and the sandals is another picture of the fact of sonship because slaves were barefoot, but the, fat, the children of the owners had shoes. Then he says, kill the fatted calf, kill the green fatted calf, and let's have a feast. Now that, to me, and I don't know if it's in any commentary, but I think it's a picture of like the marriage supper of the lamb. <laughs> Now, the commentary I read says something different, but uh, I'm going to go with what my, I think that is. But whatever you think it is, it was a celebration. And it was a celebration where he took an animal that they had been preparing for a special occasion, and he had it killed, and they had a great feast for the return of his prodigal, his disobedient, his rebellious son. And what I, I want you to notice about this whole story is not one time does the father condemn him. Not one time does he ask, what were you doing? Or how are you living? Or why did you do that? He just embraces him hope, and forgets what is past and turns towards the future and accepts him the way he is and gives him a new covering 
and he restores his position as a son. And so he will do with us. If we fall away and we come to him sincerely, he will cleanse us, restore us, and use us. And we will be his, and we will never, he will, we, he never abandons his children. Amen. And I, I didn't have this written down, but there is a passage that says that in Romans, uh, that says that nothing can separate us from God's love. Yes. Nothing. So how can we know God's love? It starts with accepting Jesus as our savior and then abiding in his love. 1 John 4.16 says, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. In the first part of this verse, John makes an emphatic declaration. We have come to know. We have come to believe that God loves us. Now notice he didn't say he automatically knew, he came to know. So this is not something that was immediately known by John. Think about the culture of John, uh, the culture John came from. The, Hebrew wor the Hebrews worshiped and feared God, but before Yeshua the Messiah came, their perception of God was an author authoritarian being who gave commandments and who was always looking to make sure that they didn't do something wrong. And one of the reasons, as I already said, Jesus came to show us that is their picture of God was all wrong. God was a loving God who was always trying to see how he could be, how they could be saved from their sins, not condemned for their sins. God knows that we cannot save ourselves. And he knows that no matter how hard we try, we will never reach the level of sanctification we would have to have in order to be in God's kingdom for all of us fall short of the glory of God. Amen. So John and other believers came to know and realize and trust in God's love by first getting to know and accepting Yeshua as their savior and then experiencing for themselves a relationship with the father through union with Yeshua. In John 15, 9 through 13, I'm going to read this from the passage, Passion Translation. It says, and Yeshua is talking, I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commands, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands. For I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. My purpose for telling you these things is so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. So this is my command. Love each other deeply as much as I have loved you. For the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. Now remember, Yeshua said that I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So this is the definition of love and how to abide in love. So how do we get to know and believe in God's love? By abiding in it. The word abide in the Greek is meno. And it is a verb, so it requires action and effort. To abide means to live in or with, to stay with, or to remain. It also means, or includes, to wait for. Most of us, when we have time with the Lord, it's pretty speedy. It's a, hi, Lord, here I am today. Thank you so much. Bye. And we don't wait. We don't abide. We don't stay. We don't remain. We don't listen. <laughs> Because we have to make time for him, just like we would make time for our friends or our spouse or something we enjoy doing. It needs to be calm and every day um, uh, time together. And as you get together, the, the Lord will begin to show you, the Father will begin to show you more and more of what heaven is like and what he has for you and, what, and just things that we can't even imagine. 
Yeshua told us how to abide in love by keeping his commandments and letting God nourish and bless us and fill us with joy. And it requires sacrifice, time, and effort, but it is worth it. Because love is God's supreme quality, he can only be known by those who live in love. Or if you're not living in love, even if you've asked Jesus to be your savior, but you are not living in love and not spending time with him, you cannot truly know his love because there will be like a barrier there. If you have hatred in your heart against anybody or anything, you're not living in love. If you react violently to things, you're not living in love. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, you are not living in and love these are all opposites of love when they exist and where they exist there is no love um, Bob Jones was a well-known prophet that went home to be with the Lord I don't know about 10 years ago or so I'm not exactly sure but once when he was a young man he died and was taken to heaven and uh, he saw long lines of people waiting to go into heaven. And he said, the angels only asked them one thing, or Yeshua only asked them one thing. I don't remember exactly which one it was, but you can look this up on YouTube in his, his testimony. He asked them, have you learned to love? Remember, it was the last commandment Jesus gave us. You, you will know you're my disciple by the love you have for one another. And he is not just the people you like. It's not just your family members or your friends. It's your enemies. He says to love your enemies. That is a lot harder. Love the people you don't like. But remember, love is not a feeling. It's an action. So you might, on the inside, not like them. But on the outside, you can be doing things to help them and praying for them and and loving them all right um, I already read I already did this I jumped ahead anyway um, so if you are not sure what it means to love uh, you can look at the life of Yeshua in the Gospels and you can meditate on first Corinthians chapter 13 which where you will find God's definition of love and uh, I considered going there and I thought no that can be a homework assignment but 1 Corinthians is great because it starts off and it gives you lit. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not easily provoked. And it just goes on and on saying what love is. And then it says what love is not. And so it's a great place to go to get a definition of love. So I just want to thank you very much for listening today. I pray all of you will learn to know the love of God in Christ Jesus. I especially pray that you, I, I, pray, I thank God today for all of the dads and fathers out there. And I want you to hug a dad today. And give, give the Heavenly Father a hug too. Right? Like a... Amen. All right. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come before you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Savior and our Lord. And I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your son that you sent for us. And I thank you for the blessings that you send us every single day. We bless you, we praise you, and we exalt you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.